All right, after all these obstacles that we had to do, we just were having trouble with the sound. Now we are back online. All right. Um, let me get into this screen right here. And uh, yeah, so uh, just a recap from what we did last time. Uh, this, these are three coaxial cables. Uh, no, 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 no. Oh, I'm getting a message here. Oh, I'm going to reclaim me being the host. All right, cool. <laughs> uh, all right, so there are three cables, three RG cables, RG59, RG6, and RG11. And just a recap from last time when we saw each other in person, uh, you can notice that uh, you can notice two things, uh, that uh, as the frequencies go up, they don't go the higher frequencies do not go as far, do not travel on its own, because once the wave are being injected into the coaxial cable, the wave travels on its own. So um, uh, the higher frequencies do not have as much punch power as the lower frequencies. You see here, here's a five megahertz. Um, per hundred feet, each as the, as the, frequency of five megahertz travels through the coaxial cable, it gets attenuated or deteriorated or gets weaker by 0 0.89 dBs, decibels. Every 100 feet, it loses 80, 0 0.89 decibels. In RG59, notice that it loses less of a signal uh, of strength in RG6, so RG6 is better in that way. And then RG11 is even better because it, the signal can uh, doesn't deteriorate or attenuate as much per 100 feet as in the other two. So that's one thing. So we can see this is the best, this is kind of next thing, and then that's the lowest uh, on the on the totem pole, yeah, all right? Now, excuse me. <coughs> uh, as we go along, the frequency is getting higher, they get attenuated more. So the higher frequencies do not have uh, as much punch through as the lower frequencies. Okay? Which means if you are installing uh, that type of a CCTV system, for example, and uh, if you were, I'm just gonna skip through that. And if you were using the, uh, something that's called RF or uh, radio frequency amplifier, um, does it say anything, RF amplifier? Um, on this one show it goes distribution amplifier all right uh all right so um that's why we have the tilt or sometimes it is called the slope okay depending on who makes it they might label it as tilt or as a slope and now the reason for that is well first you get the signal coming in from the outside hitting the distribution amplifier or the rf amplifier radio frequency amplifier. And then uh, we're using the gain on how much to boost it up uh, in order to get it out to the, whatever the network of the TVs, for example, that we have, all right? So now as we travel along, let's say there's one main RG11 cable uh, pulled through the, through the main hallway. And from there, there will be taps, tapping into that cable and, and, and distributing the TV signal. Uh, cable TV signal into the individual television sets. Uh, you will notice that towards the end of that, the lower channels, which occupy the lower frequencies, are going to come nice and clean. And the higher channels, which well, are being transmitted through the higher frequency, carrier frequencies, uh, they are not going to be as strong. They're going to become weak or, you know, kind of a snowy picture. Right? So that's why we get the tilt or a slope, sometimes it's labeled, in order to tilt up the amplification proportions. So uh, you are right off the go, you are amplifying the higher frequencies more, so by the time they get to the end, they are okay. And the lower frequencies are going to make, uh, make it there anyways, all right? So uh, that's, uh, that's what the slope or tilt idea is. 
And just as a recap, here's the input, here's the output that's uh, on the amplifier. Here's the gain or volume control, you can tell. Uh, and here is the minus 20 dB test output. And here's the minus 20 dB test output because this signal is very strong. You plug in this thing into a TV, it's going to just not look good because the signal is going to be too strong. It's just like an overdone contrast. Um, and so now uh, in order to, to see what's on the input, you need something that is being brought down to some kind of like a, a you know a reasonable signal that the TV can handle. All right, so it's minus 20 dB like a probe here. You can plug this, this coaxial cable right to the TV uh, set. And over here, same thing, a test on the output and it's taken minus 20 dB, all right? And uh, as I said yesterday, you can look at the North American television frequencies. I'm not going to look at that. It's just so you can uh, you can see uh, how the, uh, what frequencies are being used on which television channels, all right? Now, um, Okay, so we got into the broadband connection versus um, uh, versus baseband uh, or uh, yeah, broadband connection versus baseband. Remember when I was talking to you about the modem and the modem word is a combination of two words, modulation and demodulation. And also as a recap from yesterday in person class, um, <clears throat> uh, the modem uh, is modulation and demodulation, uh, uh, one word made out of two words as the internet signal comes into the modem from the outside it is in an analog form and uh, as it passes through the modem towards the um, inside of the building or a house or your facility into the LAN environment it uh, uses the ethernet protocol which is the digital uh, shape digital form of the signal okay uh, so <clears throat> Broadband connection, and uh, as we go and explain, as I explain uh, later on, uh, in, in, well, in a couple of minutes, we're going to go back to this slide, and it's going to make a little bit more sense. But you know, we have to start somewhere. All right. So, broadband internet service is the most used, common, uh, most form access because of its high speed. All right. It's offered in DSL, digital subscribe, there's line, uh, and that's the internet signal provided. Uh, over the telephone line. Okay? Now it could be provided by fiber optic cable, which would be the coaxial cable and satellite through the air. All right, now this, uh, um, I got this statement from this website here. I put it because it's kind of a nice statement, but it's kind of getting old uh, because uh, there used to be the you know, old dial-up connection and the old dial-up connection is the only not broadband connection available and uh, believe it or not is still it is still being used in some cases and i'll show you how why it's still being used so those modems are still being produced uh, 56k modems right if anybody remembers that uh, by us robotics that's the, probably the only company that still makes the dial-up modems still and those use pots all right uh, okay one thing at a time uh, so Ethernet is digital signal. And the best delivery for the Ethernet is TDM, which stands for time division multiplexing, and it is baseband modulation. Right. Now the internet, it's in an analog form. That's on the other side of the modem from the outside. Best delivery is FDM, which would be frequency division multiplexing, and this would be a broadband. So time division multiplexing is baseband, frequency division multiplexing is broadband. All right, let's see the differences. Broadband versus baseband. Connections are divided into channels. Now, do I have that? Yeah, okay, there we go. Here is the broadband connection. Here's the baseband connection, or type of a multiplexing. Multiplexing is basically, um, what is a multiplexing? A multiplexing is um, mixing something into some one common channel and then uh, for the purpose of demultiplexing it, uh, so you can so you, know, you can encode something and then you can decode something in order, in order to transmit a bunch of signals or channels more efficiently. And this is how it's done in broadband 
and this is how it's done in base bet. Now, look at this here. Here's the multiplexer, and here's the demultiplexer. Again, multiplexer and demultiplexer. A little bit different pictures, right? Okay, let's say this one has three channels now. The multiplexer can, hear, can, can carry a lot more channels than just three, but let's just look at example of three channels. Right? Now, here is just one link, one cable. And in this cable, all three channels are present at the same time, always. They just occupy different carrier frequencies. So channel one could be on one carrier frequency, and on that carrier frequency, there would be signal modulated onto it, and that signal would be, uh, that carrier would be um, uh, recognized by the demultiplexer on the other side. And this would be like, a, for example, audio signal, it will be modulated onto some kind of a carrier, demodulated, and on the other side, we have the audio signal again. Same thing on channel two, could be another kind of an audio signal or something else, maybe some music is playing, maybe somebody doesn't want to listen to me talking, maybe you want to listen to some music playing, all right? So I'll switch the channel, <laughs> all right? Excuse me. <clears throat> so uh, all the frequencies are present in that carrier, or the carrier, the well, the medium, which will be the cable. And you need a tuner to multiplex it, and you need a tuner to demultiplex it. So you just inject all the frequencies, and with the tuner on the demultiplexer, you just tune to either one of those, but all of them are present at the same time. Needless to say that this here, this medium, which would be a coaxial cable, for example, it needs to have a huge bandwidth in order to accommodate so it can fit all the frequencies there. Now, moving to the right, this would be a time division multiplexing. Here's channel A, here's channel B, here's channel C, here's channel D on the input. And on the listening side, you have, again, channel A, channel B, channel C, channel D, and so on. Now, time division, the multiplexer is going to switch between channel A and channel B, channel C and channel D on, in a time division manner. So maybe for one second, it's going to transmit just the channel D. And the next second, it's going to transmit just the channel C and so on. And then it's going to repeat that. Now, second is a long time. If you do this thing very fast, and if these two are synchronized, so when this thing is transmitting channel A only, and that thing is going to listen to channel A only, then the channel A goes through it. Right? If you do it very fast, that uh, uh, the time division, if you do it extremely fast, then to the listener, it would seem that you have a constant connection. So that's uh, what the time division multiplexing uh, consists of. Now, it could be a voice and a human ear, or it could be something else. It could be one piece of equipment and the other piece of equipment. The key idea is that these two have to be synchronized. Okay. Now, as opposed to this scenario here, you need the medium to have a huge bandwidth because you need to, uh, you need to fit everything into this pipe here. This one here doesn't need to have a huge bandwidth because it only needs enough bandwidth to transmit the information that is going to be occupied on one channel. So let's take a look at the comparisons between these two. Broadband here. Connections are divided into channels. In the basement, there is no channel division. Everything is just on one channel except it's just at different times and these are synchronized. Right? All right, each on the broadband here, each channel occupies a space within all the spectrum of the medium, for example, cable that it can handle. So basically everything is there at all times and you're just tuning to whatever you want to listen to. Right? Now on the other side, time division, each communication link occupies all the bandwidth that the medium can handle which means you don't need to have a cable that is capable of huge bandwidth. This one do, you do. This one you don't. 
you just need enough bandwidth to transmit one channel. Uh, now here, all the channels for broadband, all the channels are injected into the medium at the same time. We talked about that. And on the baseband, each communication link waits its turn to talk at the time in the time sharing manner. So this is the basic difference between broadband and baseband. Now in broadband, communications between devices, communication between devices is established through a tuning to a specific frequency in the broadband. There's a tuning involved. And in the baseband, there's no tuning involved. Well, other than that, you have to tune into that one channel that is being transmitted all the time. Uh, so no tuning is involved because the signals are not assigned to channels. They're just transmitted one at a time and repeated very fastly, okay? Now, uh, so this is the frequency division type of multiplexing. Broadband uses frequency division multiplexing here. And baseband uses time division multiplexing. All right, I hope... Uh, I hope I got my point across. If not, just let me know. Right. Now, here's the dial-up connection. And I used to have a sound that, but you know, I think I got rid of that link here because there were some troubles with that. So, um, but if you wanna, okay, I got a, I got a comment here in the chat. I noticed that uh, multiplexing is the process. I've heard about a thing called remuxing, uh, does that remultiplexing? Um, I'm gonna have to look into that. Encoding uh, and decoding, it's almost like multiplexing and demultiplexing, but it's not the same thing. Yeah, um, re-multiplexing, maybe there's, there will be some kind of um, repeaters that is involved. I'll look into that and try to give you an answer on that one. Okay. All right, let's get back to that dial-up connection. How is that dial-up connection work? Well, it's not a broadband and it's not a time division. There's no multiplexing involved. What is, what's going so here? Here's your PC. That's how it used to be done in the, like in the 90s, right? Uh, here's your PC. It is connected to a modem. And the modem, what it does, it is connected, well, the modem is connected to a regular POTS telephone line. It picks up the line. It dials the number of whatever the number is on the receiving end. And there used to be something that's called bulletin boards in the 90s uh, when the internet was kind of kicking off. Uh, and once you dial up the phone number of the facility where the server is, uh, where the bulletin uh, 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 boards uh, board is, then it will have a connection between the server here and your PC and you could uh, pull up a menu, and in that menu would be like a weather report or some kind of news maybe, or something else. Uh, uh, if you look at this right now, what's happening now, this would be a pretty primitive way of, uh, um, of using the internet, but that's what it was. Uh, <laughs> I can't believe that's say back then. Um, all right, so there is no multiplexing involved because you have like an audible connection, audio connection, and that's used in, and that would be modulated signal on it, but it was, um, uh, it was not modulated in the frequency division or time division because it was just one channel. And if you only had one telephone line in the house, once you're using the computer, well, nobody can use the phone. <laughs> Uh, that thing is still being used in, uh, well, it's not using the modems per se. However, sometimes if you're using the um, debit machine when you're paying, and as soon as you enter your information or whatever, as you use your card, the transaction goes lightning speed, bang, done. 
sometimes you have to wait maybe 20, 30 seconds for the transaction to go through. That's because that money machine is using a dial-up feature. It could be in a way that it's set up and that's it because somebody is cheap or basically that's the way it's set up. Or it could be a, maybe there's something wrong with the network and this thing falls back onto a dial-up for the time being, just so the transactions can be made, excuse me. <coughs> right. So that's one way that, uh, that the dial-up connection is used, but that's not using longer because that money machine or the, the, yeah, the, the, the money machine, the debit terminal or credit card terminal, it has that modem built in. Right. Now, where is that uh, the modems are being used, those dial-up modems, sometimes in the kind of like a fallback kind of a um i don't want to use this word emergency but uh in case of the network failure right? so what happens is that uh, you will have uh, let's say a retail store that has six cash registers right? so it'll be a relatively bigger store right? And all of them are connected to the network. Everything runs in the network. So we would have the patch panels with the Ethernet uh, uh, cables and the things are connected to the switch and the switch is connected to the gateway and everything works nicely. So if you're doing a transaction on every cash register, everything goes lightning speed. The transactions are completed uh, um, quite, uh, quite quickly. Uh, okay, I'm just looking at the here, Jacob. Uh, could dial up be used in countries of the world where their infrastructure is poor or um, rudimentary at best? Uh, yeah, sometimes our, uh, things are being used, but you'll be surprised how much of that is being used here. Uh, as, as I said, if, if you go to some sort of maybe, uh, you know, a uh, small store um, and and if you see that the transaction takes maybe 20, 25 seconds, it's a dial up. Right? So, uh, and maybe, you know, uh, if you drive out up north, which is beautiful, Canada's, Canada's Ontario, Northern Ontario is a beautiful, beautiful uh, countryside to see, but sometimes the communication is not as uh, swift as it's uh, where we are here, right? So it could be, uh, could be different reasons, right? And this is one of the reasons here that was still dial-up is being used and those modems are still being used. So let's say there are five cash, six cash registers and let's say the network fails. Okay. So there's no network, which means no transactions can be made at any of the cash registers. So, what happens is that there is a fail save, one of those, uh, uh, like a fail over cash registers kicks in. All of the cash registers are being shut down, closed, except for one. And that one, for that one cash register, this modem kicks in because it has sent, well, it's automatic. If the network fails, that modem line, just that modem kicks in and it's on one of the telephone lines. It could be a designated parts line or it could be one of those lines that they're using in the store. So they're going to know, they say, okay, don't use line one because network is down and the modem is using line one or fax machine maybe or something like that, right? Um, <clears throat> So then the transactions can still be completed. Uh, the lineup is going to get bigger. Transactions are going to get slow, but still the store can operate. And then, um, well, you call for service and uh, service technician. It could be you that comes in to service that type of situation here. Usually the service calls looks service call looks like that. You get a phone call at 5 p.m. Say, look, there's a liquor store in Stratford, for example, that um, uh, networks failed and uh, you got to go. And say. So at the same time, you can start going. And at the same time, there's a fast courier delivery uh, with a switch or the gateway here. Right? So all you have to do is take this old one out that's probably failed, put the new one there and make sure everything gets online. That will be your job. 
it ha I have done many service calls like that uh, to various different stores. And, that, you know, so you would just go and sometimes you would be there first and you would still wait for an hour or hour and a half for the courier to show up uh, with the fast delivery for the, uh, for the different gateway. And in the meantime, the modem. Now, also there are service calls uh, to like a prevent preventative maintenance. Right? Uh, periodically, if somebody has, if any of the stores have, has this kind of a system set up, you will periodically go and um, simulate network failure just to see if the, if the modem kicks in properly and uh, everything will be documented. You'll be on, on the phone at the same time with the support uh, uh, with the support staff from whatever the companies that provides the IT service and the service code lasts probably 10, 15 minutes and uh, you document that and you go on your way. So that's uh, that's as far as we wanted to uh, to to go uh, with uh, with this. Next, uh, we're just going to have one more uh, class, um, and that's I believe like a cushion class. Sometimes I'm able to deliver that, and sometimes I'm not, depending on the academic calendar and the holidays that fall within. But this time we will be able to do that. I'm going to introduce you to we'll just go over some basic procedures when it comes to infrastructure installation, service calls and whatnot. And I'll show you some of the um, tools that are being used uh, uh, and procedures while uh, involved in this type of business. Okay. So yeah, so today was a little bit shorter lesson and um, uh, I will see you on huh, online actually a week from now because uh, Monday, this coming Monday is a holiday. So we won't be able to see each other in person in class. We saw each other in person for the last time in theory class uh, yesterday. And now I'm going to see you guys in the lab, uh, open lab for the rest of the term, week 13 right now and week 14 next week, and that's going to be it. And uh, that's it for today. I noticed some uh, some people already uh, have uh, reserved the spot in the lab. Again, if you even if you don't reserve the spot in the lab, some, some of us have, I can notice that the, the, the labs are not complete. Please make sure you complete all the labs because you need to complete all the labs in order to pass this course. You cannot have one lab not performed and pass this course. That's the rules of the course. I'm not making those rules. It's basically what it is. Uh, so just make sure that you don't snooze through that kind of, uh, you know, this kind of rule. Right? Same with the theory as well. You have to have average mark of passing grade in order to pass the course in the theory part. And you have to have average mark of passing grade in completing all the labs, but all the labs have to be attended and completed. Right? All right. Cool, guys. Um, Enjoy the rest of the day, and I'll see whoever I see next time I see you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>